move along in our verse-by-verse study of Matthew, and um, we're going to look at the first part of chapter 7 this evening, and Lord willing, the latter part next week, and that'll conclude what people call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the message Christ preached as recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I remind you once again that in this passage, Christ is teaching the righteous laws of his kingdom in the dispensational context of the kingdom of heaven being at hand. There are certainly moral principles in here we can apply spiritually, but we always got to keep in mind uh, the context and understand the doctrinal interpretation concerning the kingdom of heaven. Uh, on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, there's an emphasis in these three chapters. In chapter 5, there was an emphasis on true righteousness. In chapter 6, true worship. And now, in chapter 7, we're going to see true judgment. The religious leaders in Israel pretended to have all of this going for them. Uh, they, they thought they really had righteousness, and they really had worship of God, and, and they were always judging others. But Christ exposed their hypocritical righteousness, their hypocritical worship, their hypocritical judgment. Notice back in chapter 5, verse 20. I'm sorry, I don't know why somebody would text me during church on Wednesday night. <laughs> That's a baseball text. That's why. Let me silence it. Make sure you silence your phones, all right? Always remember that. <laughs> Matthew, uh, I remember one Sunday morning I was preaching, and my brother called me. And I told him, I said, you know I'm preaching on Sunday morning at, you know, 1130. Don't call me. So anyway, but that's my brother. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 20 says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter in the kingdom of heaven. Th their righteousness was external. They weren't right in their heart, and Christ exposed them for that. They had a hypocritical show of righteousness. They, and of course, a hypocrite is someone who's purposely pretending to be something they're not. They pretended to be righteous, but they certainly were not. And the Lord knew their heart. In chapter 6, you find in verse 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. And he brings up praying, and he brings up uh, fasting, and he points out how these hypocrites would give alms and pray and fast and do all of that, not because they really loved God and had faith in God, but they did it to be seen of men. So he exposes that. In chapter 7, we are warned against hypocritical judgment. In verse 5, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And you know, these Pharisees would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And uh, they would nitpick people to death and be guilty of egregious sins in their own hearts and lives. Now, in Matthew 7, you can basically outline it this way. The theme is judgment. In verses 1 to 5, he's teaching them, judge yourself before you try to judge someone else. But he goes on to teach them about the right way to judge others in verse 6 to 20. And then Christ is the judge, verse 21 to 29. So the whole chapter, really, the theme has to do with judgment. Uh, you know, a synonym we might use for this is discernment, discretion, prudence. Look at verse 1, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now that is the most well-known verse in our culture today. It used to be John three sixteen. That was the most well-known verse in America. No, now it's Matthew 7, 1. That's the most well-known, and the reason is everybody wants to quote it when someone says something against their sin, if you point out something wrong in somebody's life, they'll say, hey, judge not. Judge not. That's what Jesus said. Judge not that you be not judged. And a lot of times they won't even quote the whole verse. They'll just say, judge not. Jesus said, judge not. 
Well, if you'll consider the context of the verse, which a lot of people never do, and then you'll look at what else the Bible says on the issue of judgment, you'll know Christ is certainly not forbidding all judgment. He's just forbidding hypocritical and unrighteous judgment. In John 7, and that's a good cross-reference for Matthew 7, 1, you ought to remember John 7, 24. Jesus said in John 7, 24, Judge not according to the appearance. See, they were trying to judge Christ for not keeping the Sabbath, but He did. But He was breaking their traditions about it. And they were judging Him on appearance in accordance with their tradition instead of the Word of God. And Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So Jesus says on one hand, judge not, and then on the other hand, he says, judge righteous judgment. So obviously there's a wrong way to judge and there's a right way to judge. Um, if we're not to judge at all, if that's what he meant by this when he said judge not, in other words, don't judge anything, don't judge anybody, not at all. If that's what he meant, how could we follow what he goes on to say in this very chapter? In verse 5, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt clearly see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. He goes on to say, you, you should help your brother if he has a problem. You ought to be able to judge that. But make sure you judge yourself first. How about verse 6? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Now he's talking about people. He said, some people are like dogs, others are like swine. And he said, don't give that which is holy to them. Don't cast your pearls before them, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. What about verse 15? Beware of false prophets, which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. You've got to judge. So if, if we're not to judge at all, how do you know who a dog is? Who, who's a dog? Who's a, who's a pig? Who is who was a sheep? Who was a wolf? <laughs> you got to judge those things. Now, the Apostle Paul, in this age of grace, writing to the body of Christ, he taught us that we are to judge things. So let's just take a break here from Matthew 7, flip over to 1 Corinthians 2. Now, I'll show you, and I don't have time to get into a whole study on judgment, because the Bible has a lot to say about it. He did warn us also against the wrong kind of judgment, and I'll say a word on that. But first, let's establish the fact that the Apostle Paul in the age of grace, writing to the body of Christ under grace, said there are things you need to judge. 1 Corinthians 2, somebody said, well, I'm not judgmental. That's because you're carnal. <laughs> if you're spiritual, you judge all things. That's what Paul said. Ver chapter 2, verse 15, 1 Corinthians 2, 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, he didn't say all people, but he judgeth all things. He knows the things of God. He can discern and know the truth of God and, and know what's uh, false doctrine against that. And there's discernment. There's, there's spiritual judgment. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. How about in um, chapter 5? Now, he said judgeth all things, but chapter 5, you got some instruction on actually judging a brother in the church. A saved man that was living in fornication and wouldn't repent of it and get right on it, and Paul said, here's the right judgment on this. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, is reported commonly that there's fornication among you. What a terrible testimony. I mean, it's commonly reported of this church. And such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He said, even the heathen don't do this kind of thing, typically. And you're puffed up. Oh, they probably thought they had liberty, right? Oh, we have liberty to do these things. No. <laughs> you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in the body, as absent in body, but present spirit. He said, I'm not even there, and I'll tell you how to handle this. Have judged already. Paul said, I've judged already on this matter. 
as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. He's judging his action. You can judge righteous judgment based on the truth of God's word. We can't judge people's motives. We don't know their heart. But we can look at what they're doing and make a proper judgment on that based on the word of God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So this was a saved man. There are consequences to sin in this life as a believer. If you're saved, you cannot lose it. You have eternal security, but you can sure mess up your life now. He said the destruction of the flesh. We won't read the whole chapter for time. Skip down to verse number 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. That's how this wicked world lives. He said, no, I'm talking about among the professing church. There's a time to separate even from professing believers. He said, now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, only God knows if he really is. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That's judgment. I don't have time to expound on all that. and That's not my point. I'm just showing you. Paul's telling the church of Corinth, you need to judge righteous judgment on this matter. Look over in chapter 6. He rebukes them because they didn't judge. Chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust, not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? See, they, they weren't able to judge because they were so carnal. They were not spiritual. They were carnal like babes in Christ. And he's rebuking them because at this point, they should have grown more than they had. It's one thing when you first get saved, you haven't learned any truth. But when, if you sit in a Bible-believing church, a Bible-teaching church for year after year, and you never grow spiritually, there's a rebuke on that. There's no excuse for that. Of course, you need to get in the Word of God for yourself. But if you're hearing sound doctrine, you need to grow up. And I tell you what, it seems like today there's just so many people, professing Christians, they have no discernment. It's like they, can't, they have a hard time discerning good from bad. But there comes a point in your spiritual growth where that ought to be a very easy thing. You need to get to the point where you can discern what's excellent. In Philippians 1, Paul prayed for the saints and he said in verse 9, Philippians 1, 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Now a lot of people, they think love is nothing more than a gushy, syrupy feeling. And if you just talk sweet, then you're full of love. Well, you might be full of something. I'm not sure... Uh, the thing is, is just talking sweet and talking syrupy doesn't prove love. Love is based in truth. It sacrifices. It's based in righteousness. A lot of people that talk about love today, they have no clue what it really is. Look what he said in the verse. That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. People say, well, I, just, you know, I love the Lord. I don't really study the Bible. I'm not really interested in the Bible, but I love the Lord. Well, if you love Him, why aren't you interested in who He is and what His Word says? There is a love that is in knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. In churches today, it's become a bad thing. It's all about feelings instead of knowledge. Well, you better know truth so that you can believe truth so that you can live truth. Your feelings will just simply deceive you. Feelings are not the main thing. The truth is the main thing. and You better know it and believe it. 
And so knowledge, he said, and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. You notice that? So the love is in knowledge, it's in judgment, and it's the fruits of righteousness. Paul said, beware of those with good words and fair speeches. You know, they're just trying to deceive the hearts of the simple. It's, it's, a lot of people today, don't take much to deceive them. Just be nice to them. They'll follow you right over the cliff. You know who the man is that really loves you? The man that will tell you the truth. Proverbs says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So, he said, being filled with fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So, you know, that's, that's enough to show you Paul is teaching that we, there are things we need to judge. Now, let's beware of the wrong kind. Look back in Romans 14, and then we'll go back to Matthew 7. Just a little detour, just to show some application. Because this issue of judgment is dealt with all through the Scripture. And if you want to have a right view of it, you've got to study everything the Bible says on it in context. Uh, Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? The context, he's talking about judging the weaker brother, and the, and the weaker brother actually judging the stronger brother on um, questionable things. And I don't have time to get into all the context. Of it. I think you're familiar with this, but notice what he said. Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We don't have the authority to be judging our brother. We don't have the ability. But the Lord, he has the authority. He has the ability. And he's going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now he's talking about a particular thing here in a particular context, judging in some of these areas that he brings up in the context. And there, so he's saying in this context, there's a wrong way to judge. And beware of that. So I won't have time to develop that any further because we've got to go back to Matthew 7. But just to give you an idea of some of those things as Paul taught. So back in Matthew 7... Because I want to get down, if possible, to verse 12 tonight. So let's move on. Matthew 7, verse 2. See, it's been, what, almost 20 minutes, and I have did verse 1. So let's get back to Matthew 7 here, okay? <clears throat> For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So that warning explains verse 1. He is warning them that they will be judged by the same standard they judge others. So they'd better think very carefully before passing judgment. If you can judge someone, it proves that you yourself know what you ought to do in that regard. So the same standard you're judging everybody else, make sure you judge yourself first. All right? You know, preachers are bad about this. Boy, they'll, they'll, they'll be straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel, judging everybody and not ever looking at their own self. I mean, they'll rail on somebody smoking a cigarette. Talking about, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And they weigh 450 pounds. I mean, that's a sin, too, in the sense of not taking care of their body. Okay. Let's be careful. Let's not be hypocritical in our judgment. If, we need to, if we're going to be passing judgment, make sure we're looking at ourselves. For, you understand what I'm saying? I hope I didn't offend anybody. I was just kind of kidding a little bit. All right. Now, I'm not saying, because I weigh close to 450, I think, so I'm not trying to, <laughs> these days it seems, I'm not trying to, all right. Um. Look in, um, look in uh, keep a marker always in Matthew 7, real quick, Romans 2 
and then we're going to go to James. You know, the key to Bible study is, is rightly dividing, but it's also comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You've got to run cross-references. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 2. Notice what Paul said here, and I'm just pointing out a principle in this. I'm not, again, I don't have time to develop the context of this. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. He just got through showing how wicked the pagan world is, and he knows that some of the religious Jews are going to think, yeah, they are, boy, they're wicked. And he's about to rip on them and said, you're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites because you know better and you still don't live right. He said... Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. Often the judgment of man isn't. But you can bank on this. The judgment of God is always according to truth. Against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? He's proving both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin, whether you're talking about the pagans or the religious man. He said, you have no righteousness. You need the righteousness of Christ. He starts Romans with the bad news. You're not righteous. Then he gives the good news. You can have the righteousness of Christ by faith. James chapter number 2 and I've told you all through the Sermon on the Mount that the, the epistle of James matches Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in so many points. James 2, verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So you get the point there. He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. You, it, you know, you better be prepared to be judged is what he's saying and how you deal with others because you're going to be dealt with. And the law, by the way, is the law because right before this he talked about some of the Ten Commandments. How can James call it a law of liberty? Because of the Jews in the tribulation that are saved and be filled with the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Ghost, it's not a yoke of bondage. It's a law of liberty. By the power of the Holy Ghost, they can walk according to that law. But it's the law. And he said, you're going to be judged by the law. But in this age, we're not under the law. We're under grace. James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. We're not, there are no 12 tribes in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. It's one spiritual man. James is not writing to us. We certainly can make applications here and there, but you better understand that James is not written to... If you try to say the book of James is written to the body of Christ, you better be prepared for some major problems because there's so much he says in conflict with what Paul said. And you don't have to water it down to make it match. They don't need to match. They're writing to different groups and different dispensations. That's the answer. Look in chapter 4, James 4, verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law. That's what he's teaching all through James. Do the law, pure religion. Okay, We're not religious in this age, and we're not under the law. <laughs> he said... But it, Now look, obviously the moral commandments, the moral principles of the law, as we walk in the Spirit, we do those things. You understand. But he said, there is, he said, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? And so on. So that matches Matthew 7. All right. Um, back to Matthew 7 again. Let's read verse 3 to 5. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And that's kind of humorous to me. It's a figure of speech, and I think the Lord, I mean, when he said strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, 
I mean, think about it. You get the, the image of that. That's pretty funny. And here he's saying, your brother has got a little speck, like a little tiny splinter, maybe even a piece of dust in his eye. And you are coming down on him saying, you better get that out of you. And you got a two by four hanging out of your eye. <laughs> I mean, it's like you got a big log. <laughs> you could just picture somebody walking around with this thing. You better let me help you get that speck out, brother. <laughs> Looks like you got a real problem. <laughs> yeah. Look in the mirror, buddy. Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So again, a mote's just a small splinter, a beam is a large log, and he's saying, how can you clearly see to judge your brother when you got so much wrong with yourself? you got a beam in your own eye. Judge yourself first before you ever try to help somebody else. In other words, you're going to come down on somebody, and yet you're guilty of even worse? Paul said, if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. The way we judge ourselves is by the Word of God. we know the, we got to know what the Word of God says. And judge ourselves in light of that. The Bible said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and a two-edged sword. Piercing even through the dividing asunder of joint and marrow. Uh, soul and spirit. I always get that. And let me turn over to it. Why in the world? I know that verse, but for some reason when I quote it, I get part of it messed up. So let me read it. Hebrews 4.12. <clears throat> Word of God is quick and powerful and sharpening two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. This is a living book. The reason why people don't like reading it is because it reads them. People say, I'm going to judge the Bible. No, it's going to judge you. But you, can you imagine man sitting in judgment on the Word of God? But they do it every Sunday when they say a better rendering would be. And you got guys don't know any Greek. And they're going to try to attack the Bible and say the Greek. You don't know what the Greek says. Just read the book in your hand and believe it. Don't sit in judgment on the Word of God. Let the Word of God judge you. It will. It's a living book. It's a discerner. Now people say, you know, if I know my heart. Well, you don't. <laughs> Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? God said, I, the Lord, know the heart, and His Word will discern your heart. Search me, O God. Try me. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. Well, He does, but you need to submit to it. And judge yourself. And if you judge yourself and lie to the Word of God, and you know that you yourself have issues that the Lord's working on, then you'll be more humble about how you go about trying to help somebody else. Okay? We all need to work on this, don't we? <laughs> because you know what? If we would hate the sin in our life as much as we hate it in everybody else's, we'd be on the right track. All right, let's move on because it's getting convicting. <laughs> Matthew 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Sweet Jesus never said a negative word about anybody, you know. Well, you never read the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John either. This is, I mean, he said even harsher than this sometimes. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, I, I've read commentaries where they go into this long diatribe about what this all means. I'll tell you very simply what I think it means. He's telling his disciples not to waste their time giving precious truth to apostates who are going to reject it and then persecute them for it. Okay? Now, go to 2 Peter 2. Let's compare Scripture with Scripture. I realize in Matthew 15, Jesus called a woman a dog, a Gentile woman. And there was a reason for that, and we'll get to that later in our study. But I don't think that's what he's, that, I don't think he's talking about Gentiles here. He says dogs and swine. And of course, the Jews thought all the Gentiles were dogs, but there were some dogs among the Jews. 
And Paul warned about them. Beware of dogs. And he said the concision, he's talking about Jews, unbelieving Jews, self-righteous Jews. And I think the right cross-reference to what he's saying here is 2 Peter chapter 2. He said that which is holy. Well, what's more holy than the Word of God? He said pearls. What's more precious than the Word of God? What's more valuable than the Word of God? 2 Peter 2 verse 20. And all through here, he is ripping on false prophets and false teachers. I mean, he is exposing them so plainly. And notice, as he gets to the end of the passage, he says, for, verse 20, For if after... Well, I tell you what, I want to read the whole passage. <laughs> um... How about verse, at least go back to verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, and a lot of times the false preachers are good speakers. Great swelling words of vanity. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. See the hypocrisy. For of whom a man is overcome, the same as he brought in bondage. And a key word in the tribulation doctrine for those in tribulation during the 70th week of Daniel, they must overcome. They must over, And they overcome by faith, but it's a faith that must be proven. Read on. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord. Now, let's just read this for what it says. Don't try to water it down. Don't try to explain it away. Read it for what it says. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. These are apostates. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they've known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, it's happened to them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The dog and the swine. Apostates. Now, in the tribulation, if a person takes the mark of the beast, they're going to the lake of fire, period. Don't even pray for them. 1 John 5 said there's a sin unto death. Don't even pray for it. Don't cast your pearls before these dogs and the swine. They've apostatized. They're worshiping the beast. They're going to hell. Don't even try to give them anything. Because all they're going to do is reject it and persecute you. Okay? The synagogue of Satan is brought up in the book of Revelation of apostate, unbelieving Jews. They're going to persecute the true godly remnant of Israel. So understand it in light of, and look, Hebrews to Revelation has doctrine that fits the 70th week of Daniel. It fits with the kingdom program of Israel. Now there, again, all the Bible's for us. There's principles there for us. But if you will read Hebrews to Revelation with that understanding that it's got to do with the tribulation period, it'll make a whole lot more sense to you. <laughs> because there's not a word in there about the rapture. It's all about the second coming. There's not a word in there about the faith of Christ. Justification by the faith of Christ is all about a man's faith. There's not a word in there about the body of Christ. It's all about Jews and Gentiles again. That's why the first book in Hebrews through Revelation is called Hebrews. And then James is written to 12 tribes. I mean, you couldn't miss it unless you wanted to. All right, there's so much there to think about. But let's go to Titus 3. Let me show you something Paul said by way of application. Because there comes a point when you're dealing with people, you just need to leave them alone. Okay? Uh, you got to have discernment on this. Now, I want to help everybody I can, but I'm going to be honest with you. There are people that try to engage me. And I get it pretty regularly because of YouTube, but there are people who try to engage me that I try to discern, and I, I'm, I'll say a word to them, discern their response. And then I just, I'm done with it. I don't go back and forth. I don't waste my time with these type of people. And Paul taught me this in Titus 3, verse 10. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, what do you do with him? You reject them. 
But see, it's pride that makes you think you're going to straighten them out. If God can't straighten them out, you're not. If a, a, a man that is convinced of his error and doesn't want to hear the truth, you're wasting your breath with them. So you just move on. Just try to help them. Give an admonition, maybe two. And if they reject it, you reject them. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. And you've got to have righteous judgment to know when to do that and how to do that. All right. Matthew 7, verse 7. Let's read verse 7 through 11. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, of whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Here's the point. Verse 11. If you then, being evil, and everybody's evil compared to God, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Now, why bring up prayer in the context of judgment? He's been talking about judgment. Well, the tribulation saints must have God's wisdom to endure to the end. That's why the first thing James says in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the first issue he brings up, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. Let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and shall be given him. Now there's a supernatural thing here. I'm going to show you this in a minute. I'm going to tell you right now, by way of application, if you want wisdom, you better study the Word of God. You better study the Word of God and believe the Word of God. You can ask God for wisdom all day long. He's not going to pour it in your head. He's talking about a supernatural enablement. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. He said, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth... And by the way, when you study, depend on God and pray. I'm not saying don't ask God. I'm just saying he's, not, he's going to give you wisdom his way, the way he's working in this age. Okay? He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So when he says, ask and it shall be given you, he obviously means asking in faith, asking the right thing. Because James even says in chapter 4, uh, you ask amiss. You ask amiss that you can consume it on your lusts. So there are, there, it's not like an unconditional blanket statement that just whatever you ask you get. That's not the point. Um, and, and the parallel passage in Luke 11, don't turn there, I'll just tell you. In Luke 11, he says something very similar. Ask and you shall, it shall be given. Seek and you shall find all that. He said, if you ask the Father, he'll give you the Holy Ghost. Asking for the Holy Ghost? That's what he said in Luke 11. Um, I'll make sure I get it right. I'll just read it to you. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? <laughs> you, you and I got no business asking God for the Holy Spirit today. If we're saved, we're sealed with the Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. <laughs> Every believer today has the Spirit, and we're sealed with the Spirit. But he means it in this sense. Look in um, Luke 21. Luke 21. Also in Matthew 10... It goes right along with this, but I won't turn there for, for time. Just look in Luke 21. Verse 12. And he's talking about, and this parallels, you know, in Matthew 10 and in Matthew 24. There are things he says. He's talking about the tribulation period and the second coming. But in Luke 21, verse 12, but before all these... They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up in the synagogues and in the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and shall turn to you for a testimony. 
Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. Well, in this age, you better meditate on the Word of God if you want to know how to answer. For I will give you a mouth. I'll give it a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed. You shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated for all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. They're going to have to patiently endure. They're going to need the wisdom to identify the Antichrist, reject the Antichrist, and know how to deal with these who are in their own family betraying them. It's going to be a time of tribulation like none other. And they need God's wisdom. But in Matthew 10, when he said something similar, he said in Matthew 10 verse, he said something very similar to what we just read in Luke 21. But he said, It is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. He said, It'll be given you what to say. You don't even have to think about it. Now there's a lot of preachers today that take that and apply it and say, you know, they think it, there's actually... Preachers that think it's wrong to study the Bible, that you ought to get up, and, and if God has given you an anointing, he will fill your mouth, and you'll just preach by the Spirit of God. That's not how it works today. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you get up and just see what happens, I guarantee you what's going to happen. You're going to preach a bunch of baloney. <laughs> you better study the word of God. Okay? Well, look back in Proverbs 8. We're about to wrap it up. Almost done. Proverbs 8. We use a lot of Scripture because it's the Scripture. <laughs> and isn't it a blessing to study the Bible and have the Word of God? Proverbs 8. I, I don't have time to develop this, but let me give you something to think about. Proverbs is not just for devotions, okay? Okay. It, in its under, understanding it doctrinally, there's prophecy in Proverbs. It's said to be prophecy in some of the verses in Proverbs. That strange woman that you keep getting warned about in Proverbs, I think it applies literally to a harlot, but spiritually to the great whore, the Babylonian religious system. And Revelation has a lot to say about that, doesn't it? And Proverbs is all about wisdom. And they're going to need God's wisdom. And Proverbs is going to be a real help to the tribulation saints. Proverbs 8, verse 1. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be of an understanding heart. Here, for I will speak of excellent things. The opening of my lips shall be right things. We won't read all of it for time. Jump down to verse 17. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Ask for the wisdom. Seek for the wisdom. Verse 34. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoso findeth me... Findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and all they that hate me love death. This matter of asking, seeking, finding, it's got to do, I believe, in particular with God's wisdom that is needed to endure to the end. If they ask for God's wisdom that they might judge righteous judgment, if they ask for it and they seek for it, they will find it. Now, a lot of people come into Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, and they don't rightly divide the word of truth, and they get a little acronym, you know, ask, seek, and knock. Here's your little sermon, you know, ask, seek, knock. You see, ask. You see that the A, the S, the K, and, and it's preached that if you believe, if you have faith, and you ask, you're going to get it. And prayer is nothing but asking and receiving. And if you're not receiving, it's because you're not asking in faith. 
And that's, that, you got, we talked about this Sunday, so I won't belabor it, but you got to rightly divide the word of truth on this issue of prayer promises. Jesus was not talking to us here, was he? We're not in the context here. And there are things that you and I have asked for we didn't get. But God will give us peace if we'll trust him. There are no promises to the body of Christ about getting whatever we ask. Those were promises in the context of the kingdom and I'm sure you're aware of that, so I, I won't for time's sake belabor that. We just preached on it this past Sunday. And we'll deal with that more in Matthew as we go along. But let's get verse 12 and finish. One verse, you know it. It's called the golden rule. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Well-known verse called the golden rule. And the liberals think this is the plan of salvation. <laughs> if you just live by this, you'll make it to heaven. Well, I got news for you. Your flesh can't live by this. Okay, your flesh, you know what your flesh cares about? Itself. Okay? No man in the flesh can live by that principle on a consistent basis. This is not the plan of salvation. And, of course, in this age of grace, the gospel, the grace of God, is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Trust in Him. You have salvation in Him. It's not Jesus as a moral example that saves us if we follow it. It's Jesus lifted up and crucified for our sins by which we're saved. And then when He saves us, He'll live in us and through us, and then the good works will come later. But good works have nothing to do with getting saved, okay? It's by grace. But at any rate... Uh, I'll just say this. He said, this is the law and the prophets. Basically, this is another way of saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. And that was commanded under the law in Leviticus 19, verse 18. And a lawyer came to Jesus in Matthew 22, and you always got to watch those lawyers. And he said, uh, what's the two great commandments? And Jesus, or what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the first is love God with all your heart and so on. The second is like to it, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, uh, you know, what he was saying there, if you look at, for an example, at the Ten Commandments, the first five have to do with your relation toward God, the other five with your relation toward man. And he's saying if you would love God and love your neighbor, you would live right. The problem is the flesh doesn't love God and love his neighbor like he ought. That's why he needs to be saved and have the Spirit of God in him. So when he, this golden rule is just another way of saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. Treat them like you want them to treat you. And that's a good principle that applies. And the only way we're going to live by that is by the Holy Spirit, because our flesh don't want to do that. Well, Israel will live by the golden rule in the kingdom because they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like I've told you before, these righteous laws and things that Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the flesh can't live up to it. But Israel will live up to it in the kingdom because they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God will be in them causing them to do these things. So I wish I had more time to deal with some things, especially about prayer. The only reason why I didn't say much about it is because we just talked about it some this past Sunday. But there will be other passages in Matthew on prayer. And there's a lot of people get very confused because they don't rightly divide that issue. Now, prayer is prayer. But there are some promises we need to understand dispensationally or we're going to get discouraged in our prayer life. So we'll just stop there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time together.